God bless you. It's good to get a chance to see you guys, speak to you. Can't see you, but at least I can speak to you anyway. Uh, might be able to see some of you if you happen to catch us on the uh, trip we're going on this week in Houston, Texas. Also, um, hopefully North Carolina. We should be there in Franklin. Again, I need to speak to the brother that is there uh, to be sure that that is still on. do need to change that date to the 11th because we should be in Asheville on the 12th. Um, and pray also for Brother Chuck there. Uh, the brother was setting that up uh, with Brother John Costick. He had a massive heart attack. Uh, right after they were looking to set this meeting up. So Satan has certainly tried to hinder uh, different places that the Lord would have us go, and I'm sure it would be a blessing for the people. I want to real quick just take you to one scripture here that um, I find kind of interesting, and I'm just going to kind of expound on that. It won't be a very long message here. I don't think it will be anyway. Uh, it's taken me a little while to get to this point. I've done several recordings and just not in my heart felt that it's the right way. Uh, going to Genesis chapter 18, verse 12. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh? Now, by the way, that's God's divine name there. So one of these three angels, so to speak, was God himself. Remember, we're not talking about the Bible. When it speaks about angels in Hebrew, doesn't mean that they necessarily have wings on but in other words, it's a form, it's a body in which God took upon himself in order to come down to speak with Abraham. A body which he could eat with, by the way, and drink and have fellowship with him. And of course, if you based it on modern day Judaic laws of uh, kosher, God broke them all that day because yes, he did eat the lamb and he drank the, the milk from the calf. So therefore, I would break the traditional uh, kosher laws, not biblical, but traditional kosher laws. Uh, so anyway, the Lord God said unto Abraham, where for did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Now, uh, and I think the next verse, hang on, it's kind of hidden from my side here. Uh, is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time I, uh, appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Now, all people, most every scholar knows that what we're seeing here, this is a type of the Yeshua himself coming. This is a type of, uh, of, of him coming. But that is Isaac, that he'd be a promised son. He'd be a promised son that would come that would seem an impossibility. Uh, because truly, Isaiah, Yeshayahu, uh, says that a virgin shall conceive. And about 800 years later, that does happen. But I want to bring some things to your attention that I find fascinating in this, several things, in fact. Um, and that is, oftentimes we look at the side of Isaac. We look at Isaac being the promised son. He is like Yeshua, the coming of Yeshua. But I want to look at the side of Sarah in this case here. And I want to take Sarah, and I'm going to kind of just rush you through uh, some interesting points here. Uh, and looking at Abraham as well, but, we're, but here's the thing. God cho chooses Abraham, okay? When Isaac does come, we see that God puts Abraham through a, tr a test. He has him take Isaac up. Again, all the types of Yeshua, we see again, he bears his own wood up. He goes up, he's willing, he lays down, he becomes, he's willing to be a sacrifice. But oddly enough, Abraham... Although he's willing to do it, God is withholding the revelation of why. He doesn't really understand it. He doesn't understand. He knows that God says it in his seed to be blessed, but he, he doesn't understand this issue about Isaac. The same with Israel. Israel truly does not get and did not get 2,000 years ago when Yeshua come that this was Isaac. This was the promised son. And so when God talks about putting Abraham into a test to see if he'd be willing to do it, what is the test? God wanted to see if in Abraham's own lineage, if his people, his descendants, would have the ability to be a true priestly nation to offer the sacrifices for sins. And this is why God did this with Abraham. This is why Abraham was willing to offer up his own son. God was trying to see if Abraham's lineage, if his people could be the priestly nation that God called them to be. If they would have the ability without any understanding whatsoever would be able to offer up Yeshua. 
which also identifies the fact that God would blind Israel to not know the true meaning of the promised son. Interesting thoughts there. And I'm just kind of sharing things with you from my heart, things that I haven't really prayed enough about to seek the full mind of God to understand all the revelations behind it, but just things that God begins to reveal to my own heart. Uh, but he hasn't tied the loose ends up yet for me. But as I said, I wanted to focus with Sarah, though. Do you know that Sarah is actually a type of Mary? Yeah, that's, a, that's a novel thought in itself, no doubt. But she is a type of Mary. She was, when God says, let me, let me take you back to Genesis. When God says to the, to, to the serpent, now he's already asked the woman, what have you done? And by the way, their names, God didn't call Adam, Adam in the beginning, and he didn't call Eve, Eve in the beginning. He called Adam, Ish. Aleph Yod Shin is how you spell his name in Hebrew. The Aleph in the Shin, the first letter and the last letter, actually spells the word fire in Hebrew. The middle letter, the Yod, is the first letter in God's divine name. Isha is what he called Eve. She wasn't called Chava or Eve at the time. She was called Isha. Again, another ironic thing. And of course, the rabbis, I know this too because the rabbis have written this in, uh, in the different writings it's written in the, uh, uh, the Midrash uh, Rashi is a great Torah commentator that wrote, wrote, speaks about this, that uh, when you look at Isha, it's Aleph Sheen, Hey. The first two letters are the word fire. The last letter, Hey, is the second letter in God's divine name. So you have Yod, Hey, Ya, in this case here. But what's ironic about this, though, is that God, when, when the fall comes, and of course, by the way, their name represents, because I know the rabbis have always wondered, why, why, we know that it represents God and, and the fire of God. It's the Holy Ghost. I mean, let's face it, that's what it is. They got the Holy Ghost. The Ruach HaKodesh is what is inside of them. That's pretty obvious, too, because when God, we know that God himself was that tree of life. How do we know that? Well, the eighth Chaim, Chaim means literally, it breaks it down, it is, it is Hashem's life. It is the God of Israel, the God Almighty, it is His life, it's what the tree of life is. The very fruit from the tree of life is God's life. I mean, why do you think Yeshua came after His resurrection and He breathed on His apostles and He said, Receive you the Holy Ghost. He was doing, He was showing them that He was the very God in Eden that breathed in Adam's nostrils the breath, Nishma Chaim. The very breath of life was breathed into His nostrils and He became what? A living soul. Ah, that was beautiful. Do you know in Hebrew it says, Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's praise God. Oh, gosh. I was wondering if I had this marked right off. I, I, I have to skip it right now. When God says he, the man became a living soul, then he refers to it in the Hebrew in the singular because he's talking about Adam. But when he breathes into his body, Chaim is in the plural. Why? Because God knew inside of Adam was his wife. But he did not breathe all the life there. In fact, God has to guard the way of the tree of life. You want to know why? See, God knew that there was going to be a fall. Even though, it, it seems kind of odd, but He knew there would there'd be a fall. See, God's not, he, you know, He's infinite in His wisdom. It's beyond our own understanding, but He's infinite in His wisdom. He he didn't want it to happen, but he knew it would have to happen. You know, he knew that, you know, the serpent was already, he'd already thrown him out. He's down here on earth. He's already, you know, or the devil, the devil's down here. The serpent was just one of the beasts there, and, and Satan happened to use that, that beast to communicate with Eve. Um, and she ended up getting tricked into all this. But ironically, though, God says, though, to the serpent after the fall, he first asked Eve, what happened? What, what did you do? I'm just paraphrasing. And she said, the serpent, he begot me. He deceived me into what I did. And then God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and between the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Now, we know that seed is the promised child. That's what the seed is. When God comes to Abraham and Sarah, he tells Abraham originally, this is before this particular verse I read to you here in, in chapter 18. He says, I will, I will, you, you, will, you will bear a son. 
I'm going to give you a son. And it's going to be by Sarah. But Sarah, like Eve, doubted the word of God and tried to bring it about another way. Now, in reality, that was similar to the situation that happened with Eve. See, Satan come to Eve and tried to get Eve to believe that the tree of knowledge was the way. The, the, the understanding. See, it's really no difference than Sarah. Now, God redeemed both these women. Don't think they're lost. They're not lost. Not one thing. There's not a single scripture for them being lost. In fact, when the fall happens in the Garden of Eden, God takes and kills a lamb to give a, make a sacrifice for sin for them. That's right there in Satan's face, by the way, too, when he sacrifices that lamb. God's showing the way that he would bring redemption right then and there. But Sarah is no different than Eve. Sarah, in, in her mind, she's trying to reason this out. Okay, God said that there's going to be a promised son. And, okay, Abraham, look, I, I can't have this child. It's just not working out. So I'm going to give you Hagar. And that's how we'll bring forth this child. You know, I don't know what was going on with Eve, but the thing is, is Satan tells her, you know, that this is, a, this is you, should, you, should, you should eat this fruit. This is what makes you wise. This, you know, this, this would resolve all the problems. You know, not that there was any problems in the Garden of Eden to begin with, but he's just trying to, to, to reason with her to accept, accept reasoning and knowledge over God's Word. And she only deceived him. She, she didn't mean anything bad by it. But Satan tricked her. Now that didn't fully cause the fall to come with what she did. But when Adam also did it, then everything went crashing down. He willfully sinned. He knowingly did wrong. Abraham did the exact same thing that Adam did. There's no difference between the two. Abraham took and believed Sarah and took Hagar for his wife. He should have never done it. There was no need to have Hagar. In fact, if anything, it has caused hatred to be against the children of Israel because the children of Ishmael that is one, that is how Satan, Satan, you don't think Satan doesn't have children? Satan brought a whole lineage down there to hate Israel. And it's, it's, but through it all, God, you know, and the funny thing is, God loved Ish, I mean, excuse me, Abraham loved Ishmael. Now, we can't blame it and say that, well, you know, because, I mean, God does say to, to, to Adam, because you've hearkened to the voice of your wife. Now, some people try to say, well, see, there, that's what women ain't supposed to say. Nothing. No, that's not true, because God also told Abraham when he said, to, when Abraham's wife said, cast the bondswoman out, he said, hearken to the voice of your wife, because Abraham didn't want to do it. Instead, he was willing to keep you know, you got to keep in mind, it wasn't wrong what he did. It wasn't wrong that he had a child by, by Hagar as far as it was a permissive will of God. Not God's perfect will, but a permissive will. Because God had already given him this command. You will have a child by Sarah. And here's where it gets really interesting. Now, Sarah... God, remember, you have to remember, God says to the serpent, he's going to put hatred between the woman and her seed and, and, and his seed. So the woman is supposed to have a seed. She's supposed to produce a child. What seed is he talking about? He wasn't talking about Isaac. He's talking about the coming of Mashiach. That's the seed that she's supposed to bring forth. Now, Sarah was the first opportunity for that child to come forth. And the ironic thing is, is see, God knew that it, was, it wasn't going to work. 
God knew that, 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 that this was going to fail. He knew that Sarah would not believe him. But it's okay. That's, sometimes it's kind of mind-blowing. It's kind of like when God comes down to Israel, when, they're, when, they, when God first brings them out of Egypt by the hand of Moses, and they go to Mount Sinai, and God is actually going to perform a marriage ceremony. God is wanting to put his spirit inside of them, but God knows that he can't do it as of yet because there's no sacrifice for sin. The life that was in the tree of life, had not come on the earth yet to be released. So when he tells the children of Israel, wash yourself, prepare yourself, I'm going to come down in your presence, I want to have that relationship with you. God knew that it couldn't happen, but yet he longed for that relationship that he had with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Because see, in the Garden of Eden, he had that one-on-one -on -one relationship with them. The life of God was inside of Adam and Eve. That's why he called him Ish, and he called her Isha. The feminine and masculine bore out in two of his children, filled with the Holy Ghost, as we would call it. The Ruach HaKodesh was living inside of them. On Mount Sinai, you know, God tells them, memory says, wash your clothes. Make ready. Bathe yourselves. See, that's why the water baptism today is you're preparing yourself for your wedding. But see, even then, God knew that he, it wouldn't happen then. It's the same thing with Abraham and Sarah. God knew that Sarah, it was only going to be a type and foreshadow. But God, what was he doing? He was bringing forth a race of people that would be the priestly nation that could bring forth that promised seed. He wanted to make sure that Abraham, that his descendants would be like him, that they would have the ability, if they can't see what they're doing, but they would still blindedly offer up the promised seed. That's what's so beautiful about this story. And Sarah, she still hung on to that same trying to figure it out the way, the way Eve, the, the mistake Eve had made. Eve was trying to, she, she, she was trying to understand and Satan deceived her into that. But like I said, the greater sin laid upon Adam. Just, just, like, with, just like with Abraham. Abraham, he takes upon himself Hagar. Now his wife Tells him, you should take Hagar. Uh, this is where the God maybe is going to bring the seed this way. It wasn't God's provided way. And the thing is, is again, Abraham did the major mistake because God told him it wasn't going to come that way. He said he's going to come through Sarah. But instead, he goes this route. And he created, he, he helped bring that word to pass where God says, thy seed Oh, let me read it to you again here in uh, Genesis. Uh, and God said unto the servant, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all the cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shall beat thee eat all the days of life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And so that type of the natural, because Abraham went to Hagar, it created a race of people that hate the Jews. This is why you don't want to be against the Jewish people also. You don't want to be against the Jews because you're, then you're following in line with what God said the devil would do. Now, I'm, I'm getting to a point, like I said, I wanted to, I wanted to show you this part of Sarah because it's so beautiful. In order for God to restore redemption, though, He would have to bring the Messiah. The tree of life, somehow or another, would have to become a human being, a kinsman redeemer like Boaz. That tree of life would have to become in flesh, the tree of life, the Ischayim. Because see, God had guarded the way of the tree of life. It's, it's interesting because no doubt when Yeshua was here, the rabbis there were pondering, how do we get back to the tree of life? How do we get back to what it was in the Garden of Eden? We know this because Yeshua says, 
I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He tells you he's the life. The life is Eis Chaim. And if he says, I am the way, what is the way? The sacrifice. But like Abraham, they were blind to their son. They couldn't understand what was going on. But let's, before we get to when Yeshua comes on the scene, there's a key thing that must happen. A mistake had to be corrected in order for the tree of life to come. And that's what I want you to see. What was the first mistake made in the Garden of Eden? It was when Eve questioned God's word. Now don't think that she didn't know. If she, you know, there, there, a lot of the scholars, a lot of rabbis as well, they try to say, well, you know, Eve sinned because she said God has said, and they say God never spoke to her. If God, if she had broken that word, if she had lied and said God has said, and she didn't say that, God would have dealt with her as a liar, not as a being deceived. God never condemns her for lying. So don't even try that. Eve didn't lie. Eve was telling the truth. The only mistake, you see, Eve with Eve, she made a mistake. She just, she got deceived into something. She was tricked into something. And she accepted the reasoning and wisdom or knowledge, of, not wisdom, but knowledge over God's word. And that's where she made the mistake. And do you not realize, in order for God to bring the seed, that's why God said to the woman or to the serpent, the woman's seed... In order to bring forth redemption, the mistake that Eve made had to be corrected. Do you realize without that, you would not have a Messiah? One simple mistake in the Garden of Eden caused all the death and destruction on the earth. Well, let me put it this way here. It doesn't cause all the death and destruction, but it began that cycle. It began to move that way, and Adam helped catapult it right over the cliff. So, they both fell. It wasn't that Eve was worse, or Adam was worse. But I mean, I, I personally, when I look at the story, when you begin to look at it, I mean, if God says that Eve was deceived, clearly God doesn't argue the fact that she was deceived into doing this. But God definitely holds it to Adam's charge. You know how we know he calls it to Adam's charge? Because the Bible says by one man, sin come into the world. Wow, that's another way of looking at it. He didn't say by one woman. He said by one man. Sin came into the world. So God hold, held Adam to accountability. It's the same thing where God said that he would put enmity between the woman, between her seed and, 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 and the serpent's seed. Hatred. And the woman also represents Israel. Well, we, we talked about that a second ago. Let me move forward though with this. In closing, let's, let me, I want to close it with this part here. In order for redemption to be brought forth, the mistake that our, our foremother Eve made had to be corrected. And I pray you never look down upon Eve. You know, see, God knew that everything was going to happen. He already knew that. He knew that there would be a fall. He knew all these things. He's infinite in His wisdom. It's for His good purpose, for His will, for His glory. I don't understand that part. I can't figure that out, and I'm not here to try to figure that out. In fact, when God says to the woman, your husband shall rule over you, He's not giving the man an authority to be the boss. He's prophesying to, his, to Eve. Literally in Hebrew, He says to her, you will turn to your husband and He will rule over you. It shows that she had her own relationship with God. 
She had a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the Lord, and she turns to her husband. Why? Because she loses the Holy Ghost, just like he is who loses the Holy Ghost. He's no better. That's why he rules over her. He's going to try to dominate her because he's bigger. Now, if God had made the woman bigger, it would have been the other way around. God would have been telling Adam, your wife's going to rule over you. But God's speaking about it because of a carnal nature. No longer is the Holy Spirit in control to govern the way the life should be. But I come back to that one point. What had to be repaired? In order for Yeshua to come, in order for Christ to come, that would turn this whole situation around, in order for that Redeemer to turn everything around, he had to have a woman that would believe him. So men, when you, when you think and you try to, to, to belittle a woman, if you think of her as less or whatever, repent of God for that. Because until God found a woman that would believe him and not question his word, but believe his word, then redemption could not have its full course. And finally, God found a little woman. He showed that Sarah, he was showing it in type already. Sarah should have believed, but it didn't work out that way. And so God had to wait many, many years later. But when Mary came along, he sent the angel into her. He says, you behold, you'll bring, you'll bring forth a child. And she said, Lord, how, how can this be me knowing no man? He said, the Holy Ghost will overshadow thee. Just like when God breathed into the nostrils of Adam, the breath of life. God breathed into her that very seed of life. And in her womb, she carried the tree of life. And when Yeshua came forth and he grew as a man, inside of that man was a tree of life. And he came to correct the mistake that Adam made. See, Mary corrected that mistake Eve made. Yeshua came to pay the price for Adam's sin. And then he took all the sin upon him. Because you have to remember, both of them were at fault. And Yeshua, in order to, res to restore back the tree of life, to give back the Holy Ghost that had been lost, it took a woman to, set, to correct the mistake that was made in the beginning. A woman that would believe the Word of God and correct that mistake. Then God was able, by that, get finally somebody that would believe His Word, every word that He says. Then He was able to place the Redeemer inside of her womb. And she brought forth... Yeshua. And Yeshua come and corrected the mistakes. There were, he came and gave his life. He became the sacrifice that God offered in the beginning. And finally, finally, the children of Israel, they were walking on the earth the day, the, the priest the high priest and the, and the elders of Israel that were there when Yeshua came. They were a type of Abraham. They could not see. They didn't truly know who the promised son was. But they were willing to offer him up. They carried out their duty faithfully. And had they not carried that out, then the Holy Spirit couldn't have come back upon us. In fact, when the Bible says when the Roman soldier pierced his side, thrust through, the water and the blood came out separately, showing that he was the rock in the wilderness journey. He was the tree of life. And of course, as I said, he breathed on his apostles after his resurrection and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. It's simple. I hope it wasn't too long. I don't know. I, don't, I can't see the time here. God bless you. 
I hope we get to see you guys on this trip here. I know there's many around the world that we won't. Pray for us. And we want to thank you, those of you that, that, that help in this ministry. Uh, and we definitely do need your help. It's the only way we can accomplish what we're doing, especially now that we're going on the trip here. Uh, we, we, we never set a price or anything when we go. We just go from our heart. And we know that God will provide. And that's where you come along with your love that you show this ministry. God bless you. We love you. And good night. Shalom.